2019 has been an important year for the way developers handle online payments. In September, banks in the EU started rolling out strong customer authentication. This means that if you have customers in the EU, they may need to log into their bank's website to authorize a payment before it can be processed. In today's video, we'll look at two different strategies you can use with Stripe to accept payments in your app, both of which are fully compatible with this 3D secure process. If you're new here, like and subscribe and check out the Stripe Payments Master Course for everything you need to know about building a payment system. In today's video, we'll be looking at how to handle one-time payments. The easy way to get paid is with Stripe Checkout. It can be implemented with zero backend code, but has limited options for customization. When we're done with that, we'll look at a more complex approach that combines Stripe elements with the Payment Intense API, and that will give us full control over the payment flow and user experience. To get started, you'll need to have a Stripe account, and then you'll also want some kind of Node.js backend. We'll be using Firebase Cloud Functions for this video, but feel free to use any Node backend that you want. In the front-end application, we just have a single product, and that is the only product that the user can buy. When they click the Purchase button, it will bring up the Stripe Checkout UI. This is a checkout flow that is completely handled by Stripe. That means you don't have to handle any of the UI coding yourself. Stripe will validate the credit card and process the payment all inside of this checkout page. And it also handles the 3D secure authentication process for customers in Europe. If the user does not complete this process by signing into their own bank and authorizing the charge, the payment will not go through. When the payment is complete, you can specify a redirect URL, and Stripe will redirect the user to a success page along with the ID of the session so you can retrieve it if necessary. And if the payment is unsuccessful or if the user cancels, you can go to a separate URL. Once you've received a payment from a user, you then need to think about how you'll actually fulfill their purchase. And this is entirely dependent on how your business operates. One option is to just go into the Stripe dashboard and do all that stuff manually. But we're developers, so we want to do everything programmatically. And the way you do that with Stripe Checkout is with a webhook. When the checkout process has been completed successfully, Stripe can send a webhook with some data to your backend server. So that means that you need to have a server that's accessible over HTTP, which is very easy to do and a perfect use case for Firebase Cloud Functions. When your Cloud Function receives the webhook, it will contain data about the payment intent. And you can use that data to implement some logic that updates your database or maybe sends an email to the user or something along those lines. What's amazing about Stripe Checkout is that we can build a payment system without writing a single line of backend code. To get started, you'll first need a Stripe account. Head over to the Stripe dashboard and then make sure to flip the switch for development mode. Under API keys, you'll see a publishable key. This key is perfectly safe to use in your front end code. However, you should never use the secret key in your front end code. We'll come back here to retrieve the secret key when we set up our webhook on Firebase Cloud Functions. Now at this point, you should know that there are two different ways you can use Stripe Checkout. The easiest approach is to use the client-only integration. To use this approach, we need to go into the Products tab and create some details about a product that we want to sell. One of the big limitations with this approach is that we can't calculate our pricing dynamically. All of the data is static based on the values that we enter here in the dashboard. If you have dynamic pricing, or maybe you offer discounts on a per-user basis, you'll likely want to generate your checkout sessions on a server. That allows you to generate products and their pricing based on your own internal logic, so you're not dependent on the products here in the dashboard. We look at how to do that in the full course, but for this simple use case, we'll just stick with the client-only integration. After you've created a product, go ahead and add a SKU to it, and then copy that SKU ID. From there, we'll go ahead and open up a terminal session and use npx to create a new Svelte app. Then inside the source directory, I'll create a component called product.svelte. Now, in order to run the checkout process, we need to include Stripe.js in this project. Instead of installing Stripe with NPM, we want to include a script tag in the head of the document. So head into the public folder to the index.html and add Stripe.js there. This ensures that you always have the latest version of Stripe.js and also allows Stripe to perform things like fraud detection in the background. From there, we can go into our product component, and the first thing we'll want to do is initialize the Stripe SDK. By including the script tag, we get a global namespace of Stripe, which we can initialize by passing it the publishable key from the Stripe dashboard. And that is how Stripe identifies our account. Next, we'll declare a few props for the product name, image, and SKU. Now, if we want to redirect the user to the checkout process, all we have to do is set up an async function, and then we'll await Stripe redirect to checkout. You can add multiple items to the checkout process and set a quantity for each one. Then you'll want to set redirect URLs for successful payments and canceled payments. If Stripe is unable to redirect the user at all, it will throw an error object. So if we get an error, we'll just go ahead and show an alert message for now. 
And now we just need a UI element for the user to trigger the checkout process. So we'll go down here to the template and add a button that fires this method when clicked. And it's also worth noting that when you're working with amounts in Stripe, they're based on a currency's lowest denomination. So an amount of 1,999 would be $19.99 in US dollars. So you'll probably want to divide the amount by 100 when showing that in your front end UI. And now we can use this product component somewhere else in the application. So we'll go into the app component and then declare the product there, then pass in the props like the SKU and the amount that we want to use for this product. And now we can run npm run dev to serve the app locally. When you click the checkout button, it should redirect the user to the checkout page with your specific product details. After a payment is submitted, you'll be able to see it on the Stripe dashboard. It's from here that you can process refunds, see the risk evaluation, download invoices, and all that good stuff. Now at this point, we've received a payment from the customer, but now we need to do our part to fulfill the product. When the payment intent has succeeded, Stripe will instantly send a webhook to a URL that we specify. The URL can point to an HTTP cloud function that will then handle the data for that payment intent and then fulfill the product for the user. So to get started on the back end, we'll need to initialize Firebase cloud functions by running Firebase init functions from the command line. And I'll be using TypeScript in this project. From there, we'll CD into the functions directory, and I'll be using Express.js, cores, and also the Stripe SDK. And then we'll also want to install types for Stripe and cores. This will give us IntelliSense for the entire Stripe API, which is incredibly useful when building a payment system on the back end. Now, one minor thing we need to do for TypeScript is go into the tsconfig and use the esnext lib. Now, in the index.ts file, we'll start by initializing Stripe by first importing it and then passing it the secret API key from the Stripe dashboard. You can see I've just hard-coded it into the source code here, but it's generally a better idea to save it as an environment variable in your Firebase project. From there, I'm going to create an Express.js app so we can create multiple API endpoints with a single cloud function. This is technically optional, but if you have a lot of different payment endpoints on your backend, it generally helps to use some sort of HTTP framework to help you manage that complexity. Or in the full Stripe course, we use something called callable functions, which integrate with the Firebase SDK on the front end to simplify both the front end and back end code, but it's beyond the scope of this video. From there, we'll create a post endpoint for our webhook. And inside this hook, the first thing we'll want to do is validate that it actually came from Stripe and not from some random hacker on the web. We can do that by looking for a Stripe signature header. And then we can use a value called the endpoint secret to decode the data that was in that request or webhook sent from Stripe. The Stripe SDK has a special method called webhooks construct event that takes the body of the request, the Stripe signature, and the endpoint secret and combines them all together into some JSON that we can actually use in our code. Now, the one thing we're missing is the actual secret key for this webhook. Head over to the Stripe dashboard and create a new webhook. The URL should be the actual location that you've deployed your Firebase function to, which in our case would be our main functions URL followed by payments slash webhook. Then for this demo, the actual webhook that you want to listen to is paymentintent.succeeded. And you can also look at the payment intent payment failed as well. Now, once you've created that webhook, go ahead and grab the secret code and then paste it into your Firebase project. And again, that would be better as a Firebase environment variable. From there, we can simply set up a switch statement to handle the type of webhook that was sent. I'm going to leave the code implementation details up to your imagination here, but you would most likely update the Firestore database or send an email to a customer or something along those lines. It's entirely dependent on the business logic of your app and the product that you sell. Then if the payment failed, you may want to send the customer an email saying you have an open invoice and here is where to pay it. And you now have a full stack payment solution with Stripe, Node.js, and Svelte. Nice. But the main drawback of Stripe Checkout is that it offers very few options to customize the user experience. So I want to finish off this video by giving you a rundown of how to use the Payment Intense API along with Stripe Elements to not only handle custom payments, but also to handle the 3D secure authentication process if it's necessary. In the Svelte app, you can see here that we enter some card details, and then if it needs to go through 3D Secure, Stripe will automatically bring up that 3D Secure process in your app's page. So the user never really leaves your app to finish their payment. Now, there's a lot more code involved in this process, and we're not going to go through it line by line. Instead, we'll look at the implementation of five different steps that you need to take to handle payment intents with Stripe elements. Step one is to create a payment intent on the back end when the user signifies an intention to pay you money. When that happens, you make a request to your back end for a payment intent object, which you can create with the Stripe SDK. 
It takes an amount, currency, and some additional optional parameters as well. In your front-end code, you'll need to make a request to this endpoint. In the Svelte app, we'll handle that with the on-mount lifecycle hook, although you should only create one payment intent per user session. In our case, we can request the payment intent using the browser fetch API, and then take the response and set it as the payment intent property on the Svelte component. That returns the payment intent from our server, which contains an important value called the client secret. Once we have the client secret, we can then move on to the third step, which is collecting the user's credit card information and building the actual credit card form. Stripe Elements provides pre-built widgets that we can use to validate credit card details on the front end. All we have to do is grab a DOM element with Svelte, and then we'll mount the Stripe card on that element. From there, we move on to step number four, which is to process the payment. And that happens entirely on Stripe server, not your own server. You do that by calling handle card payment, and it takes the client secret that you return from your own server, along with the card element where the user entered their card details here on the front end. Its return value is an updated payment intent with any charges that have been added to that intent. So it takes the payment intent you created on your back end, the card details the user entered on the front end, and turns that into an actual charge that you can fulfill. At that point, you can show the user a confirmation in the UI, and then you should actually fulfill the purchase by running a webhook, just like we did with the previous example. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up there. I hope that gave you an idea of how to work with Stripe Checkout and the Payment Intents API. And if you're serious about integrating payments into your progressive web app, consider becoming a pro member at Fireship.io to get access to the full course. Thanks for watching, and I will talk to you soon. Oh, I, I like money.